Hello everyone and welcome to my long overdue video discussion I promised on the one year anniversary of the war in Ukraine. First, let me apologize for taking far longer than I anticipated in getting it out. Now, as many of you know, I'm a full-time university professor, so my teaching and worse grading requirements obligate my time and attention first. And as I was thinking about how I was going to put this video together and what I was going to address, the first batch of paper assignments came in and in order for me to remain on top of those, uh, I have to grade about 100 papers and return to my students for them to prepare for the midterms. And so many of you know I'm a one-man show, both in teaching and grading as well as in maintaining this page. So I needed time to devote in putting together this video that just grew and grew uh, as time went on. Uh, but this past week was spring break, and uh, I have an additional couple of days off here in Uzbekistan uh, because of Novruz. It's the Persian New Year, so I had time to focus finally on getting this material out. And uh, if you are one of my students that are listening in, um, I'm really wondering what in the world you are doing uh, <laughs> for Novruz if you're listening to this material. So go and have some fun instead of dorking it up here on my channel. Uh, second, I wanted to wait and see what others were doing for their own Russia-Ukraine war one year on videos, articles, and various hot takes. And uh, as expected, American policy think tanks remain completely wedded to the official narrative, and I'll be referencing a few of those talking points throughout this video. But also, I wanted to see what official statements were going to come from Russia, particularly from Vladimir Putin and Sergei Lavrov. Uh, on top of that, as time continued to move, I wanted to wait until after the official visit by Chinese President Xi Jinping to Moscow, which just concluded today. So yes, while I'm horribly late in getting this out, I hope that the material I offer is unique. And speaking of material, I just want to also take this time to note uh, all the happenings on this channel and others over the past uh, year or so. Uh, my channel grew from about 8,000 subscribers last February to nearly 43,000 once I started doing the subtitled uh, translation videos. I know that I had said over 43,000 in January in my welcome video, and honestly, I could have sworn I looked at my page and saw 43,000. Uh, but here's to hoping that it actually reaches 43,000 in a week or two. Uh, perhaps 45,000 by May, maybe even 50,000 by the summer. Well, let's see. But I'd like to acknowledge a few other things before I begin. So if you just want to skip to the material, uh, you can find the chapter markers below. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all of my subscribers and supporters who have made this channel grow and who've become dedicated regulars on my page. I'm so glad uh, I've been able to offer this content that apparently is not available anyplace else. And again, I have to say, I'm a little surprised and even shocked. Um, I'm the only one offering subtitled translations of these speeches, addresses, and press conferences. Um, I'm equally glad in knowing so many of you find this as valuable primary source material. Uh, I've tried to remain as neutral as possible in this, uh, my presentation today will offer a rare glimpse into my own thoughts and takes. Uh, and before any of you try to figure out which side I line up on, I'll say I'm going to be an equal opportunity critic. Second, I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters, uh, who have been a major source of encouragement. Uh, in putting this video together, I asked them what they'd like me to cover, and while I want to keep names anonymous, uh, I've worked your questions and ideas into this presentation. Now, starting the summer, though I need to remind myself not to make promises before I complete them, uh, but starting the summer, um, I hope to be more interactive with my Patreon supporters than I am now, um, all of whom are doing more than just ensuring my monthly supply of coffee and beer. Uh, I really liked the three to four days it took to put this video together, and if I can, I'd like to make this a, a larger and more involved part of my time online. Uh, third, I want to say that my discussion won't cover the day-to-day -day events of the war. Uh, I don't have the time to devote to that, but needless to say, the war is ongoing, with Russia at the moment seeming to have regained the upper hand, while Ukraine still appears to be far from defeated. Now, if anything, a lot of my subscribers are also subscribers and followers of the following pages that I highly recommend checking out. First is Weeb Union, uh, which offers daily updates on the war 
and to which I've had the honor of being a guest speaker on their channel twice. Uh, Weeb's page has exploded from a few hundred followers to almost 80,000, and I've got to say he has been working like crazy in offering the most up-to-date commentary on the war. So go check his page out if you uh, don't know about it already. The second is History Legends, which offers what I honestly believe is the most informative and in-depth coverage of the war in Ukraine. And with a well-deserved list of subscribers at more than 280,000, now, not only do they offer up-to-date material about the war like Weeb Union does, but the page goes further in providing comparative analysis, background information, and excellent commentary. So go check out both pages if you haven't already. Subscribe and help them out. They both well deserve the support and the followers that they have. And finally is a page many of my subscribers have told me I'd be a perfect guest for, The Duran, which offers some excellent podcast-level discussions and analysis of the war in Ukraine, as well as wider contemporary studies in international affairs. Uh, I know I share a lot of subscribers with them, so if any of you have some influence with them, or Duran, if you're listening to me right now, <laughs> I would love to be uh, a guest on your show if you can find a spot for me. And lastly, I just want to quickly mention that if you're new to this channel or you've been recommended here by a friend, uh, consider liking to boost my visibility and subscribing and sharing with your colleagues. Uh, if you'd like to support my work, uh, you can do so either through a one-time tip via PayPal, which I thank all of you who've done so, or a monthly Patreon supporter. Now, my YouTube page is no longer monetized uh, on account of my content. Uh, and this is less because it's Russia and more because the translation services I provide don't make the video what YouTube feels as unique. Uh, I need to add my own commentary or edit the material throughout in order for the video to qualify as unique enough to monetize. Now, I've chosen not to do that. Uh, as I've just wanted to offer source material to everyone at face value for you all uh, to interpret and evaluate. Now, the good news with this is that my page not being monetized doesn't have ads anymore either. So you just kind of click and enjoy. And so with all that said, and without further ado, uh, pour yourself a drink, settle in, and let's get into it. One year after the launch of Russia's so-called special military operation in Ukraine, the world has become much more dangerous, far more unstable, and incredibly insecure. Now, within the war itself, estimates of the number of deaths, including both soldiers and civilians, has ranged from the tens of thousands to more than 100,000, with the bulk of the dead and wounded on the Ukrainian side. And the exact number, I think, won't be available until the war's conclusion, whenever that happens to be, as political and media pundits on both sides inflate and or deflate the numbers to conform to their own agenda-driven narratives. Now, the Western world has marshaled heavy sanctions against Russia and anyone who is seen to aid its war in Ukraine. And besides the military and economic war, we're also witnessing the whipping up of anti-Russian sentiment in the cultural and artistic spheres as any elements of identifiable quote-unquote Russian culture is being removed, hidden, or just simply hashtag canceled. Uh, accusations of war crimes committed by Russian and Ukrainian soldiers have dominated respective media outlets. And just a few days ago, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Russian President Vladimir Putin for war crimes related to the alleged kidnappings of uh, Ukrainian children, which has the full backing of the United States, Ukraine, and NATO. Now, suffice to say, Ukraine has become a military and ideological battleground, with millions of people displaced from their homes and economic and diplomatic fallouts that will reverberate throughout the world for years to come, with an increasing risk of the conflict escalating and spreading. Now, one year later, the U.S., Canada, and most leaders of the European Union have openly and definitively condemned Putin for his actions, have nearly emptied their military stockpile of arms and armaments for Ukraine's defense, and have intended to sever nearly all economic and energy links with Russia. And most notably was the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline in late September 2022, uh, likely on orders from the United States and the UK to sever one of the most critical pipelines connecting Russia with Germany. And uh, aside from the economic fallout over this, you know, few have even considered the ecological disaster that this will bring. Uh, amid all of this comes 
with the rising prices in food, energy, and other basic needs that have put significant pressure on already shaky economies throughout Europe. Now, this has been coupled with what can only be described as a renaissance in NATO, which has all but officially declared Russia its main adversary. And this is something that Russian leaders have long suspected. And Western leaders have routinely declared, almost boastingly, that unity and resolve have never been stronger in resisting Russian aggression. And alongside lending military assistance to Ukraine, NATO is fortifying its eastern flank in Poland and the Baltic states, while the process of admitting the erstwhile neutral states of Sweden and Finland to its ranks are in the final stages. In fact, a few days ago, Turkey, one of the last holdouts, uh, approved Finland's membership. So a year later, the effects of the conflict have reverberated around the world as well, um, as the U.S. seems to once again be engaged in a foreign policy of you're either with us or against us dichotomy, Neutral states, particularly in strategic geographic areas, are being pressured to line up on one side or the other. So small states in Europe like Serbia, which has long looked to Russia for diplomatic leverage to counter pressures from the U.S. over the frozen conflict in Kosovo, is on the verge of joining, albeit begrudgingly. Now, citizens in Moldova and Georgia are divided between maintaining strategic links to Russia or gambling on the lengthy, cumbersome, and open-ended process of closer ties to Europe and the U.S., with fears of becoming embroiled in diplomatic tugs of war like Ukraine. Mid-sized states like Turkey, Egypt, and Brazil have so far managed to steer a neutral path, although in the case of Turkey, the Erdogan government likes to play both sides in leveraging its own interests. The bigger surprise to many in the West is how large states like China and India did not automatically side with the U.S. against Russia. And in the case of China, uh, U.S.-led pressure against its own interests over Taiwan uh, seems to be pushing Beijing closer to Moscow. So in so many words, the world finds itself at the start of what I have to acknowledge is late 19th century realpolitik in the early 21st with uh, two unfortunate facts. A, Otto von Bismarck is not here to manage it all. And B, uh, it looks like it's going to get worse uh, before it uh, gets better. So I wish that uh, this presentation was more optimistic, but um, this is the reality that we find ourselves in one year after the start of the war. So after a long delay that I again thank you for your patience, make sure your food is ready, your drink is poured, in fact, have the bottle close by, and get comfortable for what I call the world one year after the Ukrainian war. Seven inconvenient truths and three uncomfortable conclusions. Now, the first inconvenient truth is probably the most obvious for anyone who's been keeping up with events, and that's that, well, no one expected to be where they or anyone else is one year later. You know, initial expectations and predictions have largely proven to be wrong, in which, well, neither side appears to be winning. Though neither side appears to be losing either. Well, within the first two weeks of the campaign, it was widely assumed that Russia's invasion, and we need to remember that no matter what side you're on, it's an invasion by one country against another, would capture Kiev, remove the Zelensky government, and replace it with a more cooperative set of leaders who would reaffirm Ukraine's ties to Moscow, cut political and economic reliance with Washington, and subsequently nullify any efforts at integrating Ukraine deeper into Europe and more specifically NATO. You know, classic regime change, right? Ukraine would be for Russia what Iraq was for the United States. Uh, but to, to the surprise of many, including many Ukrainians, right, Ukraine did not collapse but has managed to survive and, according to some media narratives, uh, successfully pushed back against Russian-led forces. Now, I say according to media narratives because much of the territory reclaimed from Russian occupation came after a preemptive Russian withdrawal, right, in places like Izium, Liman, and most famously Kurzon. Now, so to date, Ukraine has yet to successfully engage militarily with Russian forces and force them out. Now, yet yeah, this is also largely interpretive as well, because, you know, no matter how the accomplishments had been made, reclaiming of territory, right, particularly in late summer and early fall of 2022, uh, served as a critical morale boost for Ukraine, which uh, has not only managed to remain standing in this fight, as I said, but has received an unprecedented amount of support, political, financial, and military from the West. So, you know, if, if nothing else, the regaining 
of large areas of territory, including Kurzon, justified continued Western support for Zelensky. So if Putin thought that Ukraine would buckle within the first two to three weeks, uh, he underestimated both the resolve of the Ukrainian people, who we also have to be honest here, are basically fighting a total war of survival, um, as well as NATO, which uh, currently remains, you know, all in on Ukraine's defense. But the Ukrainian military effort is almost entirely dependent at this point on Western weaponry, infrastructure, intelligence, and strategic coordination. The West is deeply involved in this war with one major caveat, right? That it is not Western troops, but Ukrainian troops that are dying fighting Russian troops. So in many respects, this is a war waged by the West, but outsourced to Ukraine, which is something that I'm going to touch on in a bit. Now, at the same time, and to an even bigger surprise among U.S. officials, Russia has not been exhausted, either militarily or economically. Now, Russia's primary objectives may have changed since the outbreak of the war, and, you know, here we can't be entirely sure what Russia's, and more specifically Putin's, goals are since they remain open-ended and vague. But if Russia was either thwarted or decided to tactically disengage from taking Kiev in the first two to three weeks of the conflict, Russian forces remain overwhelmingly entrenched in wide swaths of territory in Ukraine's east and south. So currently, Russian forces hold the majority of territory in the regions of Donetsk, Lugansk, Zaporozhye, and Kurzon. And at the time of this recording, Ukraine is barely holding on to the key city of Bakhmut, which has become little more than what many analysts call a meat grinder, as Russian forces under the direction of the Wagner private military company slowly encircles and advances block by block. Now, to date, according to Telegram channels, only one muddy road remains that Ukrainian forces still control as a means of getting to and from the city. And whether this is because the last lines of defense for Bakhmut remain just that fortified, or whether Wagner is allowing the city to slowly bleed to death is up for debate. So whatever the answer, the momentum that Ukraine seemed to have enjoyed six months ago looks like it's largely evaporated. Now, let's just focus here on the loss of territory by Russian forces, right? specifically around Kharkiv, Izium, and especially Kurzon. Now, all of this was billed by Moscow as a quote-unquote tactical withdrawal to more fortified and defensible positions. Now, and so initially, Western media scoffed at what it regarded as spin. But since those decisions were made, Ukrainian forces have largely been unable to gain any additional territory. So instead, Russian forces seem to have changed tactics again, dug in for the winter months, and decided to bombard Ukrainian positions, wearing down soldiers, ammunition, and morale. What glacial gains Russian forces continue to gain in Ukraine's east, right, including the towns of Solidar, Krasnohora, and the eastern and northern neighborhoods of Bakhmut, have come at enormous costs to Ukraine, where soldiers are basically being sent to the front to get ripped apart while Zelensky refuses to call for a retreat. And, you know, herein lies one major difference. Russian forces seem more willing to cede territory than it knows it can't currently hold for the sake of preserving lives and resources, while Ukrainian leadership seems determined to hold on to every town, village, and hamlet at all costs. Now, whether this is the short-sighted decision of Zelensky and Valery Zaluzhny, Ukraine's commander-in-chief or NATO command, which is ordering Zelensky to hold the line, quote, to the last Ukrainian, end quote, as the tongue-in-cheek statement goes, remains unknown. What's important to note here is that early prognoses in Western policy and media circles that Russia would be militarily exhausted within six months of the war have proven to be wrong. The armies have not mutinied, morale has not collapsed, and Putin has not been overthrown by some imagined popular uprising throughout Russia. Now, in many ways, Russia has seemingly increased its international position as a regional power that has outmaneuvered Western-backed sanctions and is actively engaged in forming and deepening cooperative ties with a number of countries, key of which include China, India, Iran, South Africa, and Turkey, just to name a few. And while this doesn't mean that Russia is actually winning the conflict, right, they're certainly not losing.
And this last factor is connected to realizations in Western leadership circles that one year later, the rest of the world doesn't automatically sympathize with Ukraine's plight. You know, within Western political policymaking and media circles, the narrative is abundantly clear. Russia bad, Ukraine good. But many countries in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and Central and Southern Asia have taken a rather neutral position to what political leaders there regard as an internal matter between Russia and NATO, with Ukraine and more specifically the Zelensky government being duped into thinking the West was somehow going to come to its rescue. Now look, it's one thing uh, to see Russia deep in ties with other so-called rogue countries like Belarus, China, Iran, Cuba, and Syria. This was, I think, to be expected. But to see otherwise regarded pro-Western countries like Egypt, India, Mexico, Brazil, South Africa, Turkey, even Hungary, not conform to this us-them crafted narrative implies that global politics and international relations are much more dynamic and complicated in a multipolar world. You know, if anything, Western-sponsored emphasis on the plight of the ordinary Ukrainian is met with cynicism among many outside the so-called walled garden, the gated community of the European Union, as Josip Borrell once referred to it, uh, with many wondering why similar awareness for concern wasn't and hasn't been raised for Syrians, Palestinians, Afghanis, Yemenis, Libyans, Iraqis, and other peoples displaced by war. In many ways, much of the non-Western world is puzzled as to why they should give a particular damn about Ukraine. Now, the second inconvenient truth is that there appears to be no clear end in sight to this war. All participating sides condemn it. They all say it could have and should have been avoided. But all sides are saying this war will go on for a long time. And what was originally regarded as lasting a few weeks was expanded to months. And now policy and military analysts project the war lasting at least a few years. Many military figures and commentators acknowledge that in the end, there will have to be some kind of peace negotiation between Russia and the West. But all the talk now is of war. Both Biden and Putin made speeches around the first year anniversary, which talk up the need to continue fighting. And while neither side seems as of yet capable of achieving their military objectives, NATO countries continue to pour weapons into Ukraine. But more than Ukraine ending up a tactical military stalemate, there is no clear end in sight because, well, there are far too many people with an interest in prolonging the war. It makes money for people in power who suffer no direct loss in Ukraine's destruction. For some, they even benefit from the carnage, knowing the money that will be made in its post-war reconstruction, however that will look. Now, shortly after the start of the war last year, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky seemed ready to negotiate a ceasefire with Russia, right, offering to keep Ukraine out of NATO, and even going so far as leaving the status of Crimea off the negotiating table, at least for the present period. Now, according to both Vladimir Putin and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in multiple speeches, press conferences, and interviews, Russia was ready to meet with their Ukrainian counterparts for talks brokered by the Turkish government in Istanbul. But the United States and, interestingly, the United Kingdom under the then government of Boris Johnson intervened, stating that Ukraine was not yet ready to negotiate. Now, you can interpret this in a number of ways. One way, if you believe the West truly supports Ukraine, is that Ukraine had nothing to bring of its own to the bargaining table with Russia and therefore needed to regain some footing. Another way is to suggest that the war just began and a ceasefire now only further entrenches Russia's foothold in Ukraine. Well, whatever the real reason was, that was the last time Zelensky's government contemplated talks with Moscow. Since then, rhetoric has been increasingly defiant, even going so far as to suggest that negotiations will not happen until all territory seized by Russia, including Crimea, is regained. And even when Putin is no longer at the head of Russia's government. Now, such a scenario may seem highly unlikely, but it's a strategically diplomatic way of saying Kiev is all in on total war. Now, one interested party delighted with these developments is the defense industry. So, you know, if you have stocks in Raytheon, McDougal Douglas, Lockheed Martin, or Northrop Grumman, uh, enjoy the revenues because they should be able to help pay for the price of eggs these days. Now, 
one way of looking at this is that with NATO's commitment to assist Ukraine on the battlefield with additional weapons, vehicles, and ammunition, it's basically a house cleaning of old and outdated inventory that member states will be forced to restock with the newest and latest products. So demand in manufacturing will be significant in the next year or so. This not only keeps Ukraine in the war, but it also long term updates NATO states with far more advanced military equipment, the bulk of which is being sent to NATO's true eastern front in Poland, the Baltic states, Romania most likely Finland once it joins, and even little Moldova, which uh, is being pulled into the conflict and whose current government uh, is extremely pro-EU. Beyond, uh, beyond the weapons manufacturers, leading Western governments are also all in on the conflict. Right? So successive British governments from Boris Johnson to Rishi Sunak, whose domestic unpopularity is growing on almost every front, are taking a page from their American counterparts across the pond and leaning more and more on nationalistic jingoism, nativism, and warmongering to maintain its base and try to deflect attacks from home. Now, nothing will change in the event of new elections and the return of labor to power. Keir Starmer is just as committed to pledging whatever it takes to defeat Russia and uh, in what seems like an awkward attempt at some sort of political comeback or step up from his last position, uh, Boris Johnson has all but made it his personal crusade to use Ukraine as a bulwark against Russia. And efforts at continuing the war with no clear end in sight are doubly present in the United States, where the Biden administration, along with the majority of Republicans, continue to enjoy bipartisan unity on this issue, with calls from leaders on both parties to defend Ukraine at all costs, while the financial and physical infrastructure of the country continues to collapse. And there seems to be no limit to the amount of money given to Ukraine, which after one year of war amounted to more than $120 billion. And this is more than any country has received in such a short period of time from any source since the Second World War. Uh, but this isn't money that's handed to Zelensky, right? So, you know, rather the overwhelming majority of the money is allocated to the U.S. State and Defense Departments that are then spent at U.S. discretion through the U.S. Agency for International Development, U.S. aid. Um, you know, Zelensky sees very little of this, and uh, a very small percentage of the remaining funds is given to various NGOs that provide humanitarian aid to Ukrainian refugees. So in other words, the United States basically funds a war it has effectively outsourced, and with aid to Ukraine amounting to little more than 2% of its annual budget, it seems like Washington can fund this war almost as a passive side hobby, right? Now, NATO is also heavily invested in perpetuating the war for as long as possible. No, so beyond what I had already uh, noted um, about this uh, last year being the most important legitimizing reason for NATO's continued existence since the start of the Cold War, uh, NATO has effectively assumed the leadership role for Europe over the European Union. Now, since the 1990s, Russia has claimed legitimate grievance with NATO's gradual but definitive expansion eastward to include nearly every country of the former Warsaw Pact alliance. And even think of crossing what Russia considers red lines in offering membership to Georgia, Ukraine, obviously, and even Moldova. Now, it's funny how leaders never in uh, NATO seem to affirm nor deny Russia's claims of NATO's chronic violation of agreement not to expand, uh, quote, one inch further to the east, end quote, after the reunification of Germany, as Russia claims NATO had promised. And it's equally funny to wonder if NATO ever really believed its continued existence was for something other than counterbalancing Russia, since offering membership to Russia was never even remotely considered. But NATO could have easily de-escalated the conflict, uh, the security dilemma, uh, as late as December of 2021 by agreeing to terms with Russia on the military neutrality of Ukraine and by extension Georgia and Moldova. So whatever one thinks of Russia's own foreign policy outlook, um, it's abundantly clear that NATO was directly responsible for the escalation of a security dilemma with Russia not only following the Euromaidan revolution in 2014, but in the ensuing years that failed 
to reach any agreement over the status of the Donbas region following the signing of the Minsk II Accords. Uh, for NATO to somehow insist that Russia's intervention in Ukraine was as unprovoked as it was unjustified, um, I think requires a significant lapse in logic and reasoning. But that hardly lets Russia off the hook, which, when all is said and done, remember, initiated the war by invading another country. And regardless of whether you think Russia's actions are justified or not, Russia took NATO's bait and upped the ante. You know, so instead of, let's say, a small and surgical intervention that could, and I have to say should, have limited uh, been limited uh, to uh, an occupation of the Donbass as a way of pressuring Zelensky to implement the already signed Minsk II Accords and basically settle old business. Instead, Putin decided to create new business by openly declaring the independence of the self-proclaimed parastates of the Donbas People's Republic and Lugansk People's Republics. So this effectively violates the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine that it only a few years earlier agreed to uphold after it had annexed Crimea. So, you know, and to add to this, Putin extended further territorial claims on Ukraine on September the 30th, 2022, by not only annexing these two territories into Russia, but in addition, the regions of Zaporozhye and Kurzon, which had only been partially controlled by Russian forces and, of course, this effectively nullified any reason for anyone in Kiev to negotiate now that the country's very sovereignty was in question. So Putin has never been completely clear about what the end goal of the special military operation is beyond the prevention of Ukraine becoming a member of NATO and the quote-unquote denazification of the state. More is going to be talked about this later. But both of these are rather open-ended objectives that make one wonder if Russia is really aiming to control the whole territory, or barring that, control territorial regions that deprive Ukraine of economic viability. Now, up until Russia's withdrawal from Kurzon in November of last year, it seemed likely Moscow was aiming to control Ukraine's eastern and southern regions in a crescent that provided both a land route to Crimea and controlled all of Ukraine's access to the Black Sea. And it seemed like the ultimate goal was to take Odessa, and from there, a simple mopping-up campaign to the border of Moldova with a power state of Transnistria would be incorporated. Today, this seems increasingly unlikely and assumes not just the total military defeat of Ukraine, but the failure of NATO to counter Russian expansion. Still, with the annexation of about 20% of Ukraine's territory, and the intention of continuing the military campaign until all objectives are achieved, Russia is an equal contributor in indefinitely prolonging the war in Ukraine. And this gives me all the reason to believe in the third inconvenient truth that, yes, this is a proxy war between the United States and Russia. Now, let's not be under any illusions here. If this was an isolated war between Russia and Ukraine, the war would have ended a little more than a month after it began. Zelensky would have sued for peace, Russia would have insisted on Ukraine's military neutrality and autonomy for the Donbas region, and Crimea would most likely have been recognized as a part of Russia. But Ukraine serves as a legitimizing moment for the permanency of NATO and the position of the United States as the unquestioned transatlantic power in Europe. Now, the overwhelming majority of political leaders, policymakers, and media pundits in the West have condemned, rightly condemned, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and annexation of territory, lent support for Ukraine's right to self-determination, and frame the entire conflict as one limited to the defense of a smaller country against an imperialist invading force. But in a broader picture, which is becoming increasingly difficult to ignore, and what was noted in an important article by my colleague Vladimir Unkovsky Koritsa, Ukraine's self-defense serves as a perfect backdrop for what is really an inter-imperialist war. Now, I stated earlier that the war in Ukraine represents Washington's most successful outsourced war to date, because with the exception of individual Americans choosing to fight as mercenaries on Ukraine's side, 
the U.S. has not lost a single soldier. Any military hardware lent to Ukraine and lost on the battlefield is a simple write-off in use-it-or-lose-it inventory that can easily be restocked by an already overbloated military budget. The detonation of the Nord Stream pipeline and the series of economic sanctions against Russia were meant less to weaken Russia's economic capability as it really seems to have been meant to weaken Europe's dependence on it. Uh, European leaders routinely proclaim, quite proudly, of how much Europe has emancipated itself from energy dependency on Russia, while neglecting to mention how much they now rely on the United States. Now, let me be clear about all of this. All signs point to the U.S. using the conflict in Ukraine to wean Europe away from economic and energy dependency on Moscow and towards Washington. If powers in quote-unquote old Europe, like France and Germany, you might remember about 20 years ago, uh, former Secretary of State Donald Rumsfeld once dichotomizing between old Europe and new Europe. You know, if the powers in old Europe remain hesitant, the perceived rising powers of new Europe, like Poland and the Baltic states, will be more than happy to cooperate with the U.S. and tilt the power balance toward its region. The money that the United States is raking in through increased energy and military purchases goes towards the financial assistance offered to Kiev. Western aid to Ukraine is equivalent to what the U.S. annually spent on average in Afghanistan between 2002 and 2020. According to the Kiel Institute for World Economy, the West uh, sent or promised somewhere around $128 billion to Ukraine in the space of just one year alone. If this much money has been promised to Ukraine without hesitation, there is m this is more than just simply a war of self-defense. And you know, as I noted above, most of this money doesn't leave the donating countries. Rather, they are allocated as domestic subsidies for defense budgets, which will fuel an arms race that goes beyond defending Ukraine. You know, press reports say that many NATO states are having to increase military production to maintain a level of their own battle readiness while simultaneously delivering material to Ukraine. So, as I've also said, NATO members are getting rid of their supplies in deep storage while having to undergo increased spending for restocking with updated armaments. And the intended result is the creation of a NATO-led fortress Europe. Now, Washington in particular seems to think that the cost is worth it because it's doing several things simultaneously. All right, first, it's tying Western Europe to its own economy, depriving them of Russian markets. The most obvious is the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipeline. Second, it is punishing Russia for daring to be its geopolitical rival. And third, it's an indirect warning to China not to flex its own muscles against Taiwan and U.S. control in the Pacific. Now, a more specific reason for this being a much larger proxy war between the U.S. and Russia is visible in the next inconvenient truth, and that is the war is fueled by the media industrial complex, which is unable, unwilling, or just simply uninterested in what I call reading Russia right. Now, this point alone could serve as a whole standalone video, it's simply due to the power of the media to persuade public opinion to think a certain way the ruling class prefers. Uh, but for the sake of both simplicity and brevity, I'll keep it short and to the point. Um, I've heard the term media industrial complex before. I didn't come up with it, but I think it's an appropriate term to use for what is little more than propaganda, passing itself off as journalism. Now, for you all get upset, right? I'm not here to say everything is fake news. I have not taken the cue and on pill. I'm not engaging in conspiracy theories or anything else like that. But I do have to acknowledge that over the course of the last year, um, media information about the war in Ukraine and preceding that our understanding of Russia, or more specifically Russian foreign policy, um, have been shaped by two extremely important realities. Um, the first, is that much information that makes it to print in Western countries about the war is highly filtered and selectively chosen. 
and relies heavily on the Ukrainian government as a source, since it has all but barred investigative journalism from traveling to the front and reporting on events independently. So in this sense, Western media basically takes much of Zelensky's account of events at face value. The second is that long existing Russophobic sentiments in Western political policymaking and media circles have influenced the narratives delivered to audiences that at times border on hysterical levels of critical absurdity, right? So it needs to be said that Russophobia remains pathologically embedded within American and British political culture. Partially left over from Cold War sentiments by a political ruling class that came of global age during the 1980s, and partially enabled, I think, through Russia's seeming refusal to subordinate itself to U.S.-led global policy since the late 1990s, uh, a mistrust of Russia in general and uh, Vladimir Putin in particular uh, all of this appeared validated with the 2014 annexation of Crimea and uh, especially with the countless stories of Russia meddling in the 2016 U.S. presidential election that brought about Donald Trump. You know, as, you know, as if, uh, you know, 25 previous years of sustained conservative talk radio, Fox News infotainment, and the general unpopularity of the Clintons had nothing to do with any of this, but, you know, whatever. Um, you know, the deteriorating relations were um, exacerbated by NATO's continual efforts to influence Ukrainian foreign and domestic policies and reached a boiling point with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and subsequent annexation of large parts of its eastern and southern territories last year. Now, within this, right, there is the critical importance of the role of narrative, and I need to get a little bit more academic right now, right? Narrative is something that I define as a conscious connection of previously unstructured and possibly even unrelated events, figures, and ideas into a seemingly implotted framework of logic and reference, right? So in short, it's, it's a story. It's a story carefully crafted and deliberately packaged to produce an interpretation of events for an audience to accept. And a narrative isn't so much interested in explaining what happens, but how and why it happens. So it places particular emphasis on certain points, images, people, and symbols while downplaying, ignoring, or even denying others. So in this, Western media has depicted Russia as the all-evil Goliath and Ukraine as the scrappy little David. Vladimir Putin is little more than the embodiment of evil, while Volodymyr Zelensky is the paragon of democratic virtue. Um, this white-black, good versus evil, us versus them, West versus East, democracy versus authoritarianism, European civilization versus Asiatic barbarity, and this has long influenced Western perception of the so-called other, whether the other is Iraq, Iran, China, Islam, communism, Marxism, or most often used, uh, Russia. That Russia invaded Ukraine was all the pretext that was needed to frame the story, as it usually tends to be, as America once again is caught uh, with the responsibility of defending the freedom and the liberty of someone else against a clear and guilty aggressor. So within this narrative, we see buzzwords like freedom and liberty and democracy. Um, all of these are frequently used in speeches by Western leaders, almost like a checklist um, against words like oppression, tyranny, barbarity, and uh, authoritarianism. Now, paranoia about civilizational threats and ill-fitting analogies to World War II, hyper-personalized claims such as the moral evil of Putin, his alleged mental instability, his apparent deteriorating health, uh, the British are the most notorious in this avenue of sensationalism, or his allegedly increasing isolation, like all of this is taken as factual givens in articles and editorials within the West. Uh, stories about a revival of Russian nationalism and greater Russian claims to neighboring countries liken Russia today to Nazi Germany of 1936, right? So, Within that same analogy, if Russia is not stopped at Ukraine, so the narrative goes, 
then the Baltic states are next. After that, Russia will invade the Central Asian states like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and any other stan uh, most Western readers have neither heard about nor know where they are on the map. Right? So, you know, the scenarios echo like boilerplate statements without any real evidence by so-called trusted media outlets and political actors who give the impression they know that, you know, they not only have no idea what's going on in Russia, but that they honestly believe it's still 1993. You know, the point here is, right, the point here is that according to the media industrial complex, uh, that Russia under Putin is aiming to remake the Soviet Union uh, because that's the only mental image that they can visualize. But if given the slightest amount of reasoning, right, these carelessly thrown around accusations are ridiculously unfounded, right? For starters, right, the three Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia are members of NATO, so Russia can't really do anything about them. And this basically explains, in no small measure, the highly aggressive and belligerent attitudes taken against Putin by each of their leaders. Right? Um, these three states, along with Poland, serve as really the hardline members of NATO's eastern flank. And because they are in NATO, they feel completely safe in saying what they want and doing what they want, uh, knowing that there's very little that Russia can do. Secondly, Russia has no designs on Central Asia since these countries maintain good relations with Moscow and remain economically connected with each other. But to an otherwise uninformed reader of the New York Times or the Washington Post or to a passive listener of MSNBC or CNN, you know, it's easy to frame a complex story of geopolitics through the lenses of World War II or the Cold War precisely because it's a ready-made template to cast any non-Western actor as the stark aggressor. And so in doing this, the media has not so much become the voice of truth as the voice of an incredibly paranoid, uninformed, and altogether garrison-minded ruling class that seems woefully unprepared for a multipolar world. Now, this does not excuse Russia from its actions, nor does it justify Russia's own sanitized and tightly controlled journalism. But for Western countries that love to promote themselves as leaders of the free world and award peace prizes to their own ruling class, we should expect more than corporate media groupthink. And this is especially true when more than 20 years' worth of evidence of botched attempts at regime change in the name of humanitarian intervention in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Venezuela, Haiti, and elsewhere make it rather hard to believe that this time, this time, our intervention is solely and exclusively to liberate an oppressed people and deliver some form of freedom to a country bereft of qualities that Russia is actively denying. Now, this narrative becomes even more difficult to believe when one decides to research some of the groups and organizations the West upholds as freedom fighters that only a few years ago the very same media reported as far-right neo-Nazi extremists. Now, forget that actual neo-Nazis are part of those Ukrainians funded, trained, and equipped by the West. Media headlines, editorial columns, and various CNN moments have rebranded them patriots, freedom fighters, and most importantly, anti-Russians, thus making it very easy for the otherwise uninformed viewer to see and understand who the real aggressor is. Now, equally missing from these media narratives is the obvious reality that U.S. support for Ukraine isn't free. You know, since the Cold War, Washington hasn't undertaken any intervention in the name of human rights and freedom from oppression it couldn't profit from. And Ukraine is far from the exception, so don't think that we're doing this because we have good intentions. Um, if Iraq serves as the most uh, obvious example of this, uh, one can be certain that uh, territory may remain intact, but economic assets won't. And if there is any difference between Russian and American intervention in another country, it's the approach to colonialism, right? Russia uses Wagner PMC to seize territory, while the U.S. uses Halliburton to seize assets. You know, I dread to see the bill delivered to Kiev once the actual war stops, uh, which leads me to probably the most depressing point out of all of this, and that is the future of Ukraine just looks 
absolutely bleak. Um, I wish I could say otherwise, but Ukraine is the biggest loser in this conflict. Invaded by Russia, exploited by America, tempted by the EU, um, and used as a proxy by NATO, uh, Ukraine has been reduced to a debtor state and a temporarily trending hashtag. Now, though the West has rhetorically promised unwavering support to its eventual liberation, such help, as mentioned before, comes at a price. Beyond the enormous loss of life and destruction of dozens of cities and towns, Ukraine will most likely have to offer huge chunks of its economy, including industries, property, and natural resources for future auction to Western corporations by way of payment. Additionally, uh, despite the country defending itself from invasion, recent media reports, even in Western outlets, suggest mounting problems in manpower, conscription, and mobilization. Videos on social media show recruitment forces chasing down draft dodgers and fending off family members attempting to prevent their sons, brothers, or fathers from being physically taken away for conscription. You know, in February of this year, Zelensky uh, extended legislation for martial law and general mobilization for, I think, the sixth time since the start of the war, but with new additions. Now, previously, only members of Ukraine's draft commission were allowed to issue notices and only to home addresses. Now a wider group of individuals can issue the two-part document with no geographical limitation. You know, another uh, addition is over who was being called up. Uh, at first, most of the recruits were voluntary. Uh, now, uh, officials are recruiting from much less enthusiastic crowds who know they're being sent to the front, most likely not to return. Of course, there's always ways around being called up. Bribery is the usual solution, which can include uh, paying to forge bad medical records to self-smuggling out of the country. Uh, others with less financial means have taken to self-maiming to avoid military service. You know, we frequently read about Russians doing similar things to avoid conscription. You know, it's no different uh, in Ukraine. Uh, more uh, unsettlingly is uh, that on top of all of this, the Zelensky government has been clamping down on political opposition and uh, national minority rights and trade union freedoms, you know, all of which shed light on the deteriorating state of democracy in a state where uh, democracy was at the absolute best weak. Now, while the U.S. and the U.K. continue to present Ukraine as the little democracy that could, right, consistent data, including the very media outlets currently praising it, uh, has shown Ukraine to be nothing more than a hybrid regime since the collapse of the Soviet Union, with rampant cases of corruption, political oligarchism, and clientelism. All of that's just kind of swept under the rug right now. Uh, even uh, though the 2014 Euromaidan movement was depicted as Ukraine's turn away from Russia and towards democratic Europe, uh, both the Poroshenko and now Zelensky governments ended up being highly dysfunctional, corrupt, and unpopular. And prior to the outbreak of war last year, uh, Zelensky's political future looked just as doomed as Poroshenko, who... I might add, has made it out of Ukraine after numerous attempts with his family and is sitting somewhere in Europe far away from danger and accountability. Now, in a revealing article uh, written by uh, Branko Marcicic for Jacobin magazine published this past February, the already weak state of democracy in Ukraine uh, seems to have severely worsened since the invasion, uh, which has been used by the uh, Zelensky government as a pretext to centralize power and uh, crack down on dissidents and all things quote-unquote pro-Russian. And it's a very loose term that uh, is used to eliminate all forms of dissent. Uh, Marjitic writes that uh, a lack of Western media and public attention uh, coupled with uh, U.S. and European policies actively exacerbating it, it would seem, uh, are helping to fuel uh, this problem. And the biggest problem is that Ukraine is and uh, has been since the Soviet period a multi-ethnic and multicultural state uh, whose leadership, uh, beginning in 2008, uh, accelerating since 2014, and actively pursuing it since 2022, has been engaged in policies of extreme ethnocentrism and political hegemony.
Now, shortly after the invasion, the Ukrainian criminal code uh, amended in early March of last year uh, included significantly harsher punishments for treason when committed under martial law, which itself was imposed the day after the invasion. Uh, by adding the new offenses of, quote, collaborative activities, end quote, and, quote, assistance to the aggressor state, end quote, both of which were meant to simplify the law and speed up investigations and trials. Um, you know, under this new law, collaborationism uh, includes a broad range of activities from openly supporting aggression against Ukraine to the loosely defined, quote, spreading propaganda uh, to, in education, to simply just protesting the war. Uh, and since this law's passage, the number of cases for treason and uh, collaboration has exponentially increased. Now, these changes, writes Marcetich, are a way to silence Ukrainians with the allegedly wrong views and to make speaking anything other than official party policy in Ukraine uh, an imprisonable offense. Following this, Zelensky's government first suspended and then banned 11 opposition parties over alleged links to Russia. Now, alongside the suspension of two of the country's biggest parties, the most prominent was the ban on Ukraine's second largest bloc, the pro-Russian group named Opposition Platform for Life. Now, Zelensky began targeting for life with sanctions and banning several of its media outlets on the basis that they were spreading Russian propaganda because they represented the views of different groups within Ukrainian society that opposed Ukraine's war against Donbass, as well as the prosecution of dissenters. Now, since For Life's ban in 2022, um, a number of its leaders have been arrested, exiled, and stripped of their citizenship. Some uh, including the candidate who became mayor of Zelensky's hometown of uh, Krivny Rik, uh, had been killed. Now, public opinion polls before the invasion showed that pro-Russian parties and politicians had strong support in many regions of the east and south of Ukraine, but it needs to be emphasized that these pro-Russian sympathies primarily involve support for closer relations with Russia, not territorial annexation, and incorporation into Russia. And Zelensky's government has also banned, you know, a collection of left-wing parties as well, like the Union of Left Forces, the Socialist Party of Ukraine, uh, and have held up previous bans on the Communist Party. And this was part of a wider effort at decommunization that was launched um, after the 2014 uprising. Uh, meanwhile, Marcetich notes that uh, Zelensky has centralized nearly all of Ukraine's national TV channels into one government-controlled platform. In late 2022, he further tightened government control of Ukraine's media, uh, signing into law a widely criticized bill that gives unprecedented powers to Ukraine's state broadcasting regulator to fine and revoke the license of media outlets block publications without a court order, and force social media platforms to, and search engines to remove content, all under the context of combating Russian propaganda. Political persecution in Ukraine is therefore uh, rampant, and any and all f opposition figures who previously promoted the peaceful resolution of conflict with Russia have either fled or are in prison. Um, as any thought about peace talks is perceived to be playing into Putin's hands. So this has largely been ignored by Western press, which continues to champion Ukraine as a beleaguered bastion of democracy. You know, the only way to report on what's happening in Ukraine is largely through telegram channels, which unfortunately carry their own risk of being dismissed as unreliable, unprofessional, and the tool of, quote, Russian trolls and conspiracy theorists. Uh, additionally, Telegram isn't really that widely known in the West, even though it offers some of the best uh, up-to-date information on the day-to-day -day events of the war and almost always provides information that mainstream media outlets uh, just don't offer. So, for example, uh, one Telegram channel, writes Marcetich, uh, is named uh, Repression of the Left and Dissenters in Ukraine, uh, from which uh, its creation on March 15th of uh, last year, documented the deteriorating state of political freedoms and human rights in wartime Ukraine. Now, of course, for all the crackdowns on political opposition, the one wing that has remained untouched is Ukraine's far right, 
which since 2014 uh, controls a significant amount of the state's official political culture promoting racism, xenophobia, historical revisionism, and unfortunately rehabilitation of Nazi wartime collaborators as Ukrainian patriots, all within the guise of anti-communism. And most widely known is the far right-wing militia Azov Regiment, which uh, evolved from an otherwise fringe movement of the far right to a paramilitary wing of first the Poroshenko and uh, later the Zelensky governments. Now, this has produced, uh, according to dissidents who have already fled the country, uh, an atmosphere of fear in Ukrainian society who have been less able to speak freely than even during the Soviet period. Now, whether or not Zelensky himself is aware of this and controls it or is powerless to stop it is unknown. What is known is that Zelensky appears to be more and more of a figurehead over a state that is externally controlled and which allows far-right extremism to eliminate any and all dissenting voices. Now, this crackdown, writes Marcetich, has been assisted by the spread of blacklists of alleged traitors. So one of the most notorious groups is known as Mirov, Mirotvorets, or Peacemaker, which was founded in 2014 by uh, Anton uh, Garashchenko, who was a member of the Nationalist Conservative Party People's Front and later a member of uh, Ukraine's Ministry of the Interior. Uh, as something that would make even Joe McCarthy proud, <laughs> uh, the peacemaker list of names ballooned to more than 130,000 uh, registered individuals and uh, has included everyone from NGO activists, foreign politicians, pro-Russian separatists, Orthodox priests, Western celebrities and singers, uh, including Roger Waters of Pink Floyd, uh, even Kremlin critics, uh, basically anyone. Anyone who happened to take the, quote, wrong position in the eyes of the country's nationalists. And more than simply a list of uh, persona non grata, uh, those on the list uh, you know, are deemed terrorist collaborators, which enables various members of Ukraine's far right to dox them, uh, particularly journalists and others who applied for uh, press accreditation to work in separatist areas uh, since 2016. Uh, which have sparked threats against them and their families. Now, other organizations uh, have also joined in the crusade against dissension in Ukraine. Marcetich knows, uh, notes that uh, another group named Chesno, uh, which stands for Honesty, or, uh, is a prominent NGO originally focused on fair elections and good government uh, and had played uh, a leading role in the Euromaidan revolution um, also announced that it was launching what it calls a Register of Perpetrators of Treason uh, in March of last year, which uh, focuses on politicians, judges, media figures, and law enforcement officers. So like the Mirotvorets list, uh, one gets accused of treason and collaboration simply for espousing Marxist views, demanding the Azov Regiment disband, um, or advocates for the implementation of the Minsk agreements. Uh, so the group has even proclaimed uh, treason to be a family affair and has urged Ukrainians to submit family members of accused traitors and um, you know, has praised the successful assassination of alleged collaborationists in territories like Kurzon, uh, which was retaken by the uh, Ukrainian military. So groups like these um, receive significant amounts of funding from the West. And again, whether or not the National Endowment for Democracy knows its money is going to fund groups that blacklist and dox dissenters is still unknown. You know, bureaucracy tends to obscure transparency. Uh, but crackdowns on Russian cultural heritage, uh, one of the policies that fueled civil strife in the country, uh, where many continue to speak and ethnically identify as Russian um, has simply intensified. It's been a problem since 2008, but it has now become almost an inquisition since the outbreak of war. So the Ukrainian government has frequently accused, um, for instance, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church that falls under the jurisdiction of the Moscow Patriarchate, which itself is the largest Orthodox Church in the country, of long harboring pro-Russian views and collaborationism. And, uh, you know, though hundreds of priests 
have condemned the war as fratricide. Uh, the security service of Ukraine has carried out numerous raids on hundreds of churches and monasteries, and uh, at the time of this recording is uh, threatening to evict the Orthodox clergy from the uh, uh, Kiev Pechersk Lavra, which is one of the biggest and most important monasteries uh, in all of Ukraine. This war has seen numerous regional and local bans on Russian products and speaking and even learning Russian, so that by November of last year, there were nearly no schools left that taught the language. And this is particularly draconian since before 2014, every major city in Ukraine except for Lviv was a majority Russian-speaking city. Last June, Zelens the, the uh, Zelensky government created a special council to coordinate, quote, the country's movement for de-Russification, where, you know, while the Ukrainian parliament, already purged of its perceived pro-Russian parties, uh, passed uh, a number of laws curtailing Russian books and music. So fines for speaking Russian had been reported, while even a leading university outright banned the language from its campus. And this February, the Ukrainian government celebrated the purging of the country's libraries of somewhere around 19 million books, some written in Ukrainian but from the Soviet era, and 11 million written in Russian. Now, alongside this, monuments to Russian and or Soviet figures like Pushkin, Catherine the Great, and even Yuri Gagarin have been removed. Worse still, particularly in Western Ukraine, is the simultaneous erection of monuments and naming of streets to Stepan Bandera and other Nazi wartime collaborators. Now, this, these aren't conspiracy stories. These are all documented. I, I, I wish that they were fake. I wish that they were just rumors. But this is the dark side of Ukraine's turn towards Europe. This is the, the underside of Ukraine's pursuit of European democracy that uh, is either deliberately ignored or, or whatever within Western media. But, you know, in so many words, efforts to de-Russify the country um, has created what is really a war within a war, as Zelensky, like Poroshenko before him, seem bent on alienating uh, large parts of, their, of, of his country's own citizens um, that uh, identify through the Russian language or through the Russian Orthodox Church. You know, many of these citizens, particularly those outside of Crimea, consider Ukraine to be their home. You know, they identify as Ukrainian, they carry Ukrainian passports, and they see Russia as another country. But by intimidating and alienating these communities, it seems less strange then when Russian military forces take towns in Ukraine's east and south that they're graded as liberators instead of occupiers. And of course, Ukrainian media is keen to point out these traitors. Uh, but little more than a decade ago, these very same people were loyal citizens of a multi-ethnic and multicultural state. And what's worse is that when Ukraine retakes regions previously controlled by Russia, elements of the local population are now targeted as collaborators for even the slightest of offenses and often on the simple accusation of others. So Ukraine's backsliding from democratic freedoms and pluralism are unfortunately funded by U.S. and European taxpayers. And, you know, it's hard to believe that its political leaders who routinely praise Ukraine for its virtues are unaware of what happens behind the scenes, especially since 2014 when officials in Kiev chose to deepen cooperation with Washington. Thus, you know, one has to wonder whether Zelensky, who speaks far better Russian than Ukrainian, and who, when running for office, campaigned on a promise to reach a settlement with Putin, is really the one directing policy. You know, or whether he's just, you know, taking orders from uh, Victoria Nuland, who seems to have a vested interest in weaning Ukraine away from Russia at any and all cost, even if it means collaborating with and enabling its far-right extremist wing. Now, if Russophobia largely drives American political culture and foreign policy, it's at the very least plausible to believe this crackdown on any and all dissenting voices as treasonous to the state is known and condoned by the very governments offering financial aid in the pursuit of good government and future EU membership. The sixth inconvenient truth is that sanctions against Russia, at least in the last year, have not appeared to have worked. 
Now, at the beginning of the talk, I noted a number of surprises many didn't expect to find themselves or expect others to be in one year after the start of the war. And arguably, one of the biggest surprises to many in the West is that Russia has not, perhaps yet, perhaps never, uh, buckled under the weight of a series of sanctions initially billed as so crippling, so devastating, so catastrophic, it would return the country to the economic devastation, calamity, and misery of the 1990s. You know, honestly, some Western leaders seem to have almost been competing with one another over how hyperbolic their envisioned descriptions of Russia sounded. But not only have the sanctions against Russia not worked as expected, you know, they have in some ways, at least in the first year or so, backfired on the countries imposing them. Now, as early as September 2015, in an interview on 60 Minutes given by Charlie Rose to Vladimir Putin, the question was put over how Russia will handle sanctions leveled against it in light of its annexation of Crimea. Now, you know, in comparison's sake, these sanctions were slaps on the wrist to what we see today. And Putin's answer, which has become one of his philosophies, uh, has been import substitution. Now, for those who don't know what that means, it effectively implies that sanctions, while initially costly to a country that relies on international trade, has a long-term benefit to this. So by denying a country materials and resources that was previously relied on to come from external markets, demand for such goods spurs innovation and creativity to either look for alternative markets for the good or to see if the good can be produced domestically, right? thereby eliminating the reliance on foreign imports altogether. So anticipating the international economic fallout from the invasion and apparently relying on years of sustained diplomatic inroads throughout the developing world, uh, the expected sanction packages issued by the U.S. and the EU did just that, right? It spurred Russia to deepen cooperative ties with India, China, and Iran, right? All of which continue to purchase Russian gas, but now through the Russian ruble instead of the dollar. Now, this resulted in two additional outcomes that I think largely counterbalanced the sanctions. First, it continued the supply of Russian gas to markets. And second, it stabilized the ruble from inflation. So at the start of the war, the value of the Russian ruble briefly fell to record lows before spiking in early July of 2022 to its strongest levels in years. Now, currently, the ruble is about as strong as it was uh, pre-invasion. But this isn't to suggest that Russia hasn't been affected. No, I mean, at, at least half of Russia's nearly $600 billion currency reserves lie frozen in overseas accounts, and most of its banks remain cut off from global payment systems. So unless import substitution produces the intended results, or Russia is able to secure materials from alternative markets, right, the country is going to suffer shortages in machine parts needed from everything from computers to aviation. And, you know, Russia's GDP was also predicted to shrink by 15 percent, though that estimate appears to have been seriously overestimated, with more realistic numbers dropping between 2 to 3 percent. Right? Western media is insistent that sanctions are working, and if the Russian economy isn't going to quickly collapse, uh, it's going to suffer from a slow, lingering death. So, you know, fear not, O oh ye readers of The Economist or Financial Times, right? This, of course, is being said while economies in the West seem to be entering recession numbers of their own, but, you know, yeah, you know, Russia's done for, sure. Um, you know, apart from a number of billionaire oligarchs being denied access to their yachts, penthouse apartments, and bank accounts, uh, the biggest potential fallout uh, appears to be the immense brain drain that began to trickle at the start of the war last year, but grew to a near exodus of intellectuals following Putin's calls for a partial mobilization. But still even here, uh, the loss of intellectual capital also seems coupled with the loss of Russia's most potential source of unrest and opposition to the war. Uh, so by allowing hundreds of thousands of Russians to leave for states in Central Asia and the Caucasus, uh, would-be protesters uh, you know, are out of the country, uh, but are still connected to companies in Russia, but still working remotely. So in order for sanctions to achieve their intended goal, it requires the coordinating action of all leading economies to impose them. So the sanctions ended up being only targeted from the West, while growing markets in India, China, and elsewhere never really saw the logic in them.
Now, additionally, the nature of the sanctions tended to target Russia's top economic elite rather than the collective sanctions that have a more devastating effect on the general population. So billionaire oligarchs that are kept from their yachts and penthouse apartments in New York or London, well, they don't really tend to keep ordinary people awake at night. You know, and even more to the point, in a recent address to the uh, Russian Federal Assembly, uh, Putin seemed to have chided those billionaires who kept overseas assets instead of uh, investing in Russia with, say, sort of an I told you so response, uh, which was met with uh, laughter and uh, approval from the audience. But most importantly, sanctions have a way of being overcome through numerous shell companies, third-party vendors, and the simple black market. Um, sanctions rarely, if ever, affect the targeted country, and beyond import substitution, nothing fosters creative improvisation better uh, than being denied access to money and goods. And even more so, the deprivation of markets in Russia towards Europe means many countries issuing the sanctions now have to find alternative sources of energy, uh, with the initial fallout resulting in price spikes and product scarcity. Right, so it's not ordinary Russians experiencing these things at the local supermarket, but rather ordinary Germans, British, Poles, Bulgarians, and Estonians. You know, fuel that would otherwise uh, come from Russia now comes from third-party vendors still buying from Russia, but with a markup in price. You know, Ukraine has experienced this consequence for nearly a decade after 2014, when the country officially announced it was no longer energy dependent on Russian gas, uh, but instead bought it through Slovakia and Hungary, where the pipelines running from Russia through Ukraine right, entered the territory of their Western neighbors and then turned 180 degrees around back into Ukraine where the gas was tapped. You know, all a nice little profit for uh, Slovakia and Hungary. Uh, so by at least still having a monopoly on the supply of energy in the last year, uh, Russia has been able to actually profit from the various third-party markets. So whatever financial losses were envisioned from the sanctions meant to cripple the country, uh, these were offset with profits from these vendors and uh, intensified demand from emerging markets in Asia. You know, if you remember last year paying anywhere between 50 to to $100 at the pump in the U.S., know that the cost was caused by oil companies jacking the prices up in response to the U.S. markets losing 3% of our supply after closing the door to Russia. Urgh. So take that, Putler. And finally, about the, you know, finally, this talk about alternative and uh, emerging markets, the end of American unipolarism and the need for global unity against a common aggressor raises the last inconvenient truth. And that is, China is siding with Russia. And there's really nothing the U.S. can do about it. You know, China's relations with Russia have traditionally been good and uh, have significantly grown over the last few years. But there was no evidence to suggest it would have openly sided with Moscow's intervention in Ukraine. You know, for most of last year, China was at pains to maintain its neutrality. And, you know, although continuing to trade with Russia, Chinese leadership uh, refused to either condemn or support the invasion. Uh, but as the year progressed, uh, China became closer to Russia, while relations with America significantly deteriorated. Uh, and if the U.S. regards Russia as some regional irritant whose attempts at a post-Soviet comeback need to be stamped out, you know, China is seen as the chief economic rival. You know, so rather than simply serving as America's source of cheap, outsourced sweatshop labor, uh, China is evolving from a labor to a consumer market, and with this comes a more assertive foreign policy that sees itself as a great power with its own regional interests and security concerns, right, both of which conflict with America's. So long considered an economic partner too important to alienate, but a political rival too powerful to ignore, China was and remains a country that the U.S. really can't do much to contain. No, so the increasingly fractious relationship between these two powers uh, if you may remember, recently culminated in the U.S. shooting down of a Chinese spy balloon that uh, still managed to get great aerial footage of whatever it was recording, you know, followed by the cancellation of uh, U.S. Uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken's diplomatic trip uh, to Beijing. But the chief reason of contention is the determination of the U.S., along with the U.K., and to a lesser but no less important extent the EU, to defend Taiwan against what China sees as an internal matter to solve. 
Now, even though Taiwan has remained a para-state since the 1970s and has no official diplomatic ties with the U.S., it maintains close relations with Washington and other Western powers, all of whom are keen on preventing its absorption into mainland China. Now, for years, this open-ended issue rested on a sort of agree-to-disagree and live-and-let-live -live arrangement between Washington and Beijing. Uh, but two events have contributed to the rise in tensions. The first, obviously, is Russia's uh, intervention in Ukraine, beginning with the annexation of Crimea in 2014. Uh, this raises uh, questions in American policymaking circles. Uh, if something like this would serve as an opening for China to make um, a similar move over Taiwan. And the second is America's increasingly vocal commitment to defend Taiwan from Chinese encroachment, right, regardless of whether there is evidence of China ratcheting anything up at all. There's actually this second point that contributes to the growing security dilemma in the East China Sea today. So as China's foreign policy has become more assertive in recent years, uh, the U.S. has uh, reaffirmed its commitments to defend Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. And the visit by uh, Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan in early August uh, 2022 was both a testament to Washington's determination to defend the independence of this non-recognized state, as well as signaling to China that it could still go where and do what it wanted in China's perceived sphere of influence. You know, in many ways, this was an absolutely brilliant, if brazenly reckless move. Uh, but Pelosi knew she could enrage China with the visit, but also knew that uh, they couldn't really do anything about it, at least not militarily. But what this has done is push China and Russia closer together in common belief of the United States as aggressively intrusive. So it's not that China needs Russia, right? If anything, it's well, probably the reverse at this point. But still, it's more than telling and equally not surprising when fast on the heels of President Biden's visit to Ukraine and Poland a few weeks ago, China's senior diplomat and foreign, uh, former Foreign Minister Wang Yi met with Sergei Lavrov to organize a two-day meeting between Putin and Xi Jinping in Moscow that, at the time of this recording, has just concluded. Now, relations between the two have always been strong. And while the details of the meeting are only just now emerging, it's speculated that the two countries will deepen all diplomatic and economic ties, reaffirm their joint commitment towards securing a stable multipolar world, and probably broadening both countries' leadership roles in the Shanghai Cooperative Organization. Now, what some in the West think is that this meeting will see China offer some kind of military assistance to Russia in Ukraine, which, of course, will be routinely condemned. But just as China couldn't do anything over U.S. officials visiting Taiwan, U.S. officials really can't do anything over China deepening its cooperative partnership with Russia. And in a way, China may be concerned that the war is providing a testing ground for new military tech, which it believes military hawks in Washington may think of using for any upcoming war in the Pacific. And you know, given the deteriorating um, state of affairs in the last one to two years between the U.S. and China, it's really not that far-fetched to believe uh, Washington-Beijing rivalry in East Asia can spill over into more open conflict. Uh, whether economically or even militarily. Yeah, the question is, will the U.S. shift focus away from Ukraine and towards Taiwan if conditions worsen? So these are what I've identified as seven inconvenient truths about the war in Ukraine in specific and global development in general. Now, nothing here should be inherently mind-blowing for anyone who's been keeping up with events and having access to news and information outside mainstream Western channels. And I wish I could sound more optimistic and hopeful for a conclusion to the war, but at the moment, it seems that all parties that could bring an end to the war are digging in their heels for some kind of protracted conflict. And this is especially particular for the United States, which has taken up the liberalist mantle in defending what it honestly believes is the sovereign democratic rights of another state in need. Now, again, I feel Ukraine is the biggest loser in this whole affair, torn apart as it is between great power politics in Washington and Moscow. So, in keeping 
with my original 10-point presentation and offering seven inconvenient truths, uh, <laughs> let me finish this discussion by being predictably cliche and uh, offer three uncomfortable conclusions to all of this. And the first, or point eight, depending upon how you're keeping count, is that the Westphalian system is under attack by great powers, once again. Now, for all those non-international relations students out there, the Westphalian system is a principle in international law that says every state possesses exclusive sovereignty to its territory. Now, what we in the field understand to be something that came out of the so-called Treaty or Peace of Westphalia in 1648 has served as a foundational cornerstone to much of international relations studies ever since and forms a critical component to the fundamental principles of the United Nations Charter. Now, of course, it's easy to see that each state possessing exclusive sovereignty to its territory was challenged you know, well before 2022. And uh, even in the absence of the dictator of the day invading the little defenseless country next door for a bigger power to liberate scenario, you know, advocates of humanitarian intervention have been the biggest challengers to this principle, which means that before anyone points the finger at Russia, uh, make sure to wave in the general direction of the United States. Now, few are going to condemn true humanitarian intervention if it comes as assistance. You know, I, I mean, the recent assistance lent to Turkey and Syria in the wake of the earthquake was wonderful. But larger states frequently frame their own national strategic interests in states and regions within the context of this type of positive intervention. So, for example, in a number of speeches and uh, press conferences last year, uh, Vladimir Putin has often alluded to the principles of sovereignty, saying that in this day and age, states can be either sovereign, that is, having final say over its fate, or colonies which end up being the exploited appendage of other powers. Now, according to Putin, the biggest violator of state sovereignty, and thus one of the fundamental principles of the UN, are the coalition of Western countries being led by the US via NATO. And he and Sergei Lavrov frequently list Serbia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, and others that have been witness to this type of US-led intervention. Now, interventionism has long been a privileged practice of great powers. And the funny thing is that the loudest voices condemning intervention of another state tends to come from those states with a long history of intervention of its own. It's just that the intervention in question that's being condemned is being done by someone else. Now, part of Putin's foreign policy for Russia has been labeled something known as sovereign democracy. Now, sovereign democracy is the uh, it was understood to be the growth and consolidation of robust state institutions that make it impervious to, if not highly resistant against, external pressures or controls. Now, Russia frequently criticizes the United States for being one of the biggest violators of other states' sovereignty, even though Russia has been actively involved on its own in the internal affairs of states like Ukraine and Georgia, right, for years, right, if not decades. The difference is how sovereignty is influenced. Now, one of the key principles of the UN Charter is that state borders are untouchable, right? The borders are borders, and any redrawing of the map absolutely must involve the United Nations, as well as the consent of the state whose borders are being altered for someone else. Again, this isn't something that no longer happens. I mean, for instance, uh, just only a few short years ago, South Sudan emerged from Sudan itself um, in 2011. And a couple of years even prior to that, little Montenegro seceded from an earlier, albeit loose, union with Serbia in 2006. Now, in both cases, though, the larger state, Sudan and Serbia, agreed to these changes. What Russia has been accused of since 2014, however, is drawing new borders at whim against the consent of the target state. But this is really the only difference separating Russia from the United States, right? Which usually keeps the borders of the target state intact while still intervening and engaging in multiple attempts at regime change. So when remarking on Russia's intervention uh, in Crimea in 2014, the then Secretary of State John Kerry called it, and I quote, an incredible act of aggression 
to invade another country, end quote. And uh, in what I'm forced to conclude was either a complete lapse in cognitive reasoning or a telling sign of naivete, uh, or maybe he's just forced to read, you know, from the brochure, uh, Kerry commented that, quote, you just don't in the 21st century behave in 19th century fashion by invading another country on completely trumped up pretexts. Now, if you want to take a moment to figure out the proper Serbian or Iraqi rebuke to that, feel free to pause the video and come back when you're ready. But, you know, indeed for a country like Serbia, uh, the United States was actively involved in supporting secessionism in its southern province of Kosovo, and today insists that Kosovo is an independent and sovereign state, despite it having limited recognition and no membership in, let alone prospects in joining, the UN, NATO, or the EU. So while Russia is largely accused for behaving in 19th century fashion in the 21st, it's basically writing a variation of a previously written American theme. And when confronted on this issue, U.S. officials usually have nothing else to say but that Kosovo was a quote-unquote special case, which is largely based on the irrefutable evidence of, dude, trust me on this. Now, this isn't meant to justify Russia's actions any more than America's, but it's been abundantly clear since 2008 when Kosovo was given the green light by the U.S. to unilaterally secede from Serbia that state borders can and will be disregarded by great powers with their own interests that will be masked behind some prescripted podium uh, argument justifying the move. Now, that's of little comfort to states like Serbia, Ukraine, Georgia, or you know, anyone else that falls under the power politics of larger states that enjoy permanent membership on the UN Security Council. But beyond the whole, you can't do what we do lament, right? no country intervenes in the affairs of another on what it believes to be trumped up pretexts to return to Kerry's statement from before. You know, countries with the ability to interfere in the affairs of others do so with a list of what they think are completely plausible and justifiable reasons, even if those reasons are little more than lofty statements for the press. So the primary reason is national interest, right? Russia's intervention in Ukraine can easily be seen as unjustified to everyone but Russia. You know, just as America's intervention in countless states in the last century alone can be seen as acts of imperialism to everyone you know, but the United States. The problem we find ourselves in today is that Ukraine's sovereignty over its own affairs have been continuously violated by both Russia and the U.S. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, competing imperial interests in Ukraine between Russia and the United States take different approaches. Now, Russia is just basically going after as much of Ukraine's territory as possible. While the U.S. aims to uphold Ukrainian sovereignty and freedom while taking what's left of its resources for its stock portfolio. Now, I mentioned earlier that the 21st century seems like a return to the realpolitik of the 19th. And the U.S. is, has been, and will remain an active great power participant in these affairs. Now, alongside this, it's not that difficult to see China taking a more proactive role in the internal affairs of other states as well, Taiwan uh, being the chief one. What this shows is that great power politics is returning, while international organizations like the UN that were established to do away with these practices are basically powerless to stop them. You know, indeed, I'd even, I, you know, look, I'd even go so far as to say in the world today that there are four countries with the ability to do whatever they want without significant repercussions. The United States, Russia, China, and even Israel. And while I wouldn't consider Israel a great power, it, along with the other three, possess capabilities of intervening in the affairs of other states for the sake of its own national interests and security without any real consequence to do whatever you want and then find ways of justifying it within or around legal loopholes has defined much of international affairs since the late 1990s. And the second conclusion and uh, ninth point to be made here, and this stems directly from what I had uh, just pointed out, is that liberalism is failing from its own self-inflicted wounds. Now, I'm going to get a little academic again and uh, emphasize that liberalism in the international relations field is slightly different from the liberalism that's frequently used and misunderstood in political discussions. So the two are not the same. And as a school of thought, 
right? Liberalism draws from the writings and philosophies of Immanuel Kant, Jeremy Bentham, Adam Smith, John Locke, and Woodrow Wilson, just to name a few. And I have a standalone video on my channel that uh, I'll link here. Uh, but the basic understandings of liberalism in the international relations field is that states do not cooperate with one another for power and security, but rather work together to achieve common goals. So unlike realism, which claims that states operate in a realm of international anarchy, and here that basically means that there's no higher authority than states in the international system, right? So it's not uh, synonymous with chaos. Uh, liberalism contends that uh, common and collective cause for peace and security fosters cooperation, right? which in turn uh, reduces the level of uncertainty and unpredictability between states and simultaneously facilitates cooperation and trust. So this is um, most visibly seen in the role of institutions like the UN or the EU, uh, both of which work for the benefit of states resolving differences before they become contentious. So liberalism is uh, notably uh, more optimistic about human capabilities and uh, argues for the existence of universal values of life, liberty, and welfare. All right, so to this, uh, liberalism believes it is the obligation of certain enlightened states to uh, uphold principles of human rights, which means that sometimes wars can be justified if the cause is delivering people from some kind of oppression. So um, here, actually, is where liberalism starts to get problematic, though, uh, because while wars are condemned, uh, liberalism argues in favor of intervention on uh, what it regards as, let's say, noble grounds, right? So liberalism gives a state an ethos and an ideology in intervening in the affairs of others. And uh, this rests on two general theories, commercial pacifism and democratic peace. Now, commercial pacifism forms the cornerstone of transnational economic interdependency. So basically, the idea is that no two states will go to war with each other if they are economically interconnected, because to invade one by the other undermines the economies of both, right? Thus, uh, integration fosters cooperation, and any disagreements between the two uh, can be met through dialogue and negotiation. Now, the theory of democratic peace strengthens this further by stating democracies don't go to war with other democracies. It's just as simple as that, right? No two democracies go to war with each other. Thus, the more democracies there are in the world, the less likelihood there will be for conflict. So if democracy spreads, a so-called oasis for peace exists in which wars are, for all purposes, extinguished. Now, liberal institutionalists love to highlight post-war Europe as an example of how this can happen, right? So basically, with the establishment of what would become the European Union, coupled with strong international law from the UN, uh, this has eliminated war between Germany and France, right? And, you know, any lingering doubts could be picked up by NATO, which, um, you know, is a military organization, but one that identifies as a bulwark of collective security of the liberal West, uh, historically against the Soviet Union, and now by, you know, most estimates, um, you know, against Russia. So the United States has long taken up the liberalist mantle in shaping its foreign policy, especially following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, wars are waged, at least officially, in the name of halting oppression of people, overthrowing tyrannical regimes, and spreading the good word of democracy and free market capitalism to parts of the world most in need of it. Now, the only trouble with this mechanism is that liberalism tends to be, ironically, uh, the most belligerent type of foreign policy, uh, because it effectively gives a noble purpose towards interventionism. And, you know, in the end, targeted states end up worse than they were before. Again, to note, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, and Syria are just a few uh, that most know today. Now, this isn't to say that the theory of liberalism is problematic or even wrong. You know, rather, liberalism is a mechanism used by states to mask what are really ulterior motives and objectives. Now, this is where Professor John Mearsheimer, widely regarded as the current standard bearer of realism in the academic discipline, uh, has effectively enjoyed a revival of a discipline um, long regarded as obsolete, right? Now, so, so, since the early 1990s, right? Mearsheimer has been 
uh, writing about the merits of realism in an increasingly globalizing and interconnecting world, where many by 2000 regarded his arguments, his writings, his positions as, you know, obsolete. Uh, but since the failures in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, coupled with obvious examples of power politics in Ukraine since 2014 showed, uh, Mearsheimer has enjoyed something of a scholarly renaissance in his field and uh, has gone on to become one of those rare distinctive cases of an academic that's popular in public circles. And this usually means something incredibly popular or something incredibly controversial was said. You know, either way, if you've heard of him, and some of you I would imagine have, it's a rarity uh, in academia. So in his recently published uh, book, The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Realities, uh, Mearsheimer argues that liberalism has actually weakened global security instead of strengthening it uh, because it serves as a recipe for endless wars through a series of ill-fated attempts at regime change uh, that only create new problems and security dilemmas. Right? So, you know, in so many words, you know, if you take the um, philosophy of liberalism at uh, heart, the idea is, is that if more democracies exist in the world, the less likely wars will be. Well, we can do really one of two things. A, we can wait for large parts of the world to finally democratize, or we can realize that that's going to take too long, creates their own security dilemmas, so countries with good intentions will intervene in parts of the world in order to, um, you know, get the process moving. All right, so in other words, the road to perpetual peace is paved with probably World Wars three, four, and God, I hope not five, right? But we're talking about safer worlds through a number of interventionist policies. Now, there's lots of points to discuss that, you know, once again, I think need a separate video for, but I tend to agree with Mearsheimer's assessments. Um, but from the point of view of constructivism, of which I identify through, uh, now, the problem I have with Mearsheimer's argument isn't so much that liberalism serves as little more than ideological justification for what's actually and ultimately power politics, just dressed up differently, but that, um, you know, he tends to conclude that in the end, you know, we're all realists in self-pursuit of power and security. I, he's, he's right about 85% of the way, but, you know, I think a little differently, and what I think helps get us to the other 15% um, is constructivism, which, you know, I have uh, a number of videos that I talk about, which I also will link here. But, you know, suffice to say, constructivism is less a standalone theory than what I like to call a mod for an existing theory to just simply make better. All right, so in this, uh, constructivism is based on the notion of how states identify themselves and others in the world. So it's basically how one state sees another. Now, a state like the United States looks at other countries and sees them as allies or enemies, neutral, a strategic partner, regional rival, cooperative, belligerent, terrorist, rogue, uh, and other adjectives. Right? In fact, that's actually a good way of putting it. Right? Constructivism is foreign policy with labels. The U.S. sees Russia as authoritarian, while not really seeming to care about worse authoritarian policies in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the U.S. looks at Cuba as communist, but somehow doesn't see Vietnam in the same manner. Uh, the U.S. can condemn the violation of sovereignty to Ukraine and Georgia, but somehow not see the parallel with its own actions in Serbia. Right, so in other words, constructivism helps us understand why states like the U.S. or Russia uh, can be friendly and cooperative with some while being hostile and belligerent towards others. So liberalism isn't really a universal philosophy so much as it's directed towards countries that Western states can trust, while these same states behave like realists to others. So in this, Mearsheimer is you know, absolutely on the money in noting the hypocrisy the double standards, and self-interested foreign policies of the U.S., the U.K., um, and other liberal Western governments in using the mantle of democracy, freedom, and human rights to advance their interests in certain areas while ignoring the lack of these rights in others. Right? So in other words, let's say 
Why would the U.S. care so much about the plight of Ukraine when they don't care what's happening in Yemen? Why has the U.S. Uh, been so determined to overthrow the government of Saddam Hussein while doing everything it can to protect governments in Saudi Arabia? Right? There's questions like this. And the problem with liberalism um, isn't that the principles are wrong so much as they are really selectively applied. Right? So if we truly care about human rights, right, we'd still be in Afghanistan. We would be far more scrutinous of Zelensky's uh, government's actions towards its non-Ukrainian minorities. And at the very least, we would be reigning in its neo-Nazi elements. Um, and even more so, we'd actually give a damn about the Palestinians. Right? But we don't. Right? But, but we don't. And this is picked up by a number of other powers which note the hypocritical double standards of Western liberal governments whose you know, credibility over the last 20 years has deteriorated tremendously. So, so let me put it this way. Right? If one can say with an unfortunate degree of honesty that Iraq was better under Saddam than it is now, if Libya was better under Gaddafi, than it is now, and if Syria remains better under Assad uh, than any other scenario, then intervention did little more than serve the interests of foreign Western powers. Now, for those interested in reading more about the consequences of American-led regime change outside of World War II, I recommend Stephen Kinzer's book, Overthrow, America's Century of Regime Change from Hawaii to Iraq. Now, again, this isn't to say that the philosophies of liberalism are wrong. Rather, they're being used and abused by Western powers as a way of trying to justify what is really selective diplomacy connected to regional power politics. So realists like Mearsheimer and Professor Stephen Walt would say this is just Western powers trying to justify their actions that are no different in the pursuit of power and security as any other great power. Constructivists like me would argue that the U.S. and U.K. leaders actually believe that they're better, right? They believe that they are morally superior to anything coming out of Moscow, Beijing, or any other non-Western center. And this would be fine if the results proved the claims, but the best proof for the consequences of liberalist interventionism come from the liberalist states themselves, right? especially when other states are condemned for the very actions Western liberal states do. And this leads me to the final point and conclusion of this analysis, which is that when all is said and done, the United States simply seems woefully unprepared for the multipolar world that it finds itself in. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but in the year that I've been providing English subtitles to speeches, press conferences, and uh, addresses by both Putin and Lavrov, I've noticed that both of them have been using a lot of academic rhetoric uh, in their statements. And... While I'm pretty certain that Lavrov has read Mearsheimer's work and found validation in his findings, though I need to stress that Mearsheimer isn't a supporter of Russia, uh, despite some of his critics claiming he is, um, I also think both Lavrov and Putin have read through uh, Sam Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, uh, which was never really a great book. It was not the most academically rigorous, but it is one that became popular in policy circles following 9-11. Now, both Putin and Lavrov made frequent reference uh, of a number of non-Western civilizations achieving global prominence and being able to resist and even push back against Western liberal cultural encroachment. Now, to this, we also hear them noting how the age of American unipolarism is over and a new multipolar world is dawning. And to any academic and international relations, this is nothing really new. Uh, we've been discussing this in seminars and academic papers that have been written in obscure and publicly inaccessible journals since the early 1990s. I really have a, a bone to pick uh, about uh, the state of academia. But uh, in this, I also find nothing wrong, right? The world has been changing and shifting away from American-led unipolarism of the 90s uh, ever since, I think, the early 2000s. And the gradual but definitive shift towards multipolarism began, I feel, uh, since Russia's intervention in Syria around 2015. And I think we have absolutely reached a stage of multipolarism since our pullout uh, in Afghanistan in 2021. Now, with Russia's continued entrenchment in Ukraine, 
China's increasing assertiveness in East Asia, and America uh, unable to really counter either, the U.S. finds itself at a table of other world powers, uh, but is either unable or unwilling to acknowledge it. Now, within the academic literature on power alignment, unipolar powers don't last long simply because new powers inevitably rise. I mean, the former unipolar power doesn't necessarily collapse, but it finds itself met with powers of equal capability it can either cooperate or compete with. And in the U.S.'s case, I think we had a good 10, 15-year run before the globe started getting competitive again. Now, again, this is nothing history has not shown beforehand. Right? The United States is not unique in this situation. The important thing is how declining unipolar powers take the news. Right? Some gracefully and rationally adapt to the new realities, and you know, others deny, resist, and fight tooth and nail to maintain hegemonic relevance. And while this can prolong hegemony, uh, the inevitable, well, inevitably happens. So even more so if we look at this through the constructivist lens, the perception by rising powers that the old hegemon is working to prevent alternative voices, diplomats, markets, and interests from manifesting only furthers the sense of rivalry and uh, antagonism. So in other words, rising powers like Russia and China didn't originally perceive the U.S. to be belligerent, competitive, and hostile, right? Both, at least according to their own narratives, envisioned a multipolar world of multilateralism, cooperation, and interconnectedness. But by actively denying and even undermining legitimate security concerns to both, a multipolar world is becoming more competitive and problematic. Now, probably the best example of this is the recently concluded meeting in Moscow between Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping, where a number of joint agreements and memorandums of understanding have brought both countries into all but a formal alliance. And as I mentioned earlier, this is mostly being seen as problematic, even belligerent to Western leaders. While a minority of voices have said this is just a consequence of Western hubris and belligerency against both sides. But what's even more telling is the recent and major diplomatic victory secured by China in brokering a normalization of relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia, right? two countries that have long been rivals for regional power in the Middle East. Now, this is the first time China has flexed its diplomatic muscles outside anything regarding Taiwan. And probably the most telling thing is how China and Russia engage with Iran and Saudi Arabia on equal footing, while the U.S. still remains wedded to this concept of withholding any communication with states it doesn't like, such as North Korea, Cuba, Syria, and Iran. Now, if I can be a little less academic for the moment, uh, this is just pure idiocy in this day and age, right? especially in the Middle East, where Russia has been making active diplomatic inroads in all countries of the region. Now that China is basically throwing its own metaphoric hat into the ring and brought the two largest Muslim powers together, the U.S. seems to be the odd man out. So this increasing sense of impending irrelevancy seems reflected in most of its media and editorial coverage of the world today. But beyond Ukraine and beyond Taiwan, U.S. foreign policy, and specifically the elites speaking on its behalf, seem more and more reactionary to events outside of its control. So when asked about the recent Saudi-Iranian rapprochement, uh, Biden was noted to have said something like, the better relations between Israel and their Arab neighbors, the better for everybody. Now, if you can figure out what that's or how that's related to this, I mean, I'd be happy to know. Uh, and sort of to add to the collection of incoherent responses, again, this is what happens when you're wedded to the boilerplate statements of the State Department. Um, spokesperson Ned Price commented that, quote, no country on earth has done more to build a more stable, more integrated Middle East. And I'm sure he absolutely believes that. Now, the point here is that leading figures in American political policymaking and even media circles seem more and more unable to cope with the new realities of the world. Now, some political figures like Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Lindsey Graham, and Victoria Nuland, to name a few, 
I still want to believe it's 1993 and everyone around the world either looks to the U.S. for leadership or cowers from its awesomeness. Now, when Sergei Lavrov gives three-hour press conferences providing micro-analytical details of signed agreements, when Putin offers precision-level information about economic, infrastructural, and diplomatic developments, and when Wang Yi achieves decisive diplomatic victories in the Middle East just before flying to Russia to secure you know, a two-day summit between Putin and Xi, Rhetorical statements about America, the West, and Europe being steadfast defenders of all that's good in the world uh, because of their commitment to Ukraine, uh, while ignoring the metaphoric and literal train derailments in their own backyards, make it all the starker of which countries seem more prepared for the next 10 to 20 years. And when the very newspapers that vocally supported intervention in Iraq 20 years ago are now unironically writing editorials of how and why we invaded, uh, while reactionary war hawks like John Bolton insist we failed in Iraq because the U.S. didn't invade Iran as well, uh, you know, sort of gives the impression the U.S. is sort of undergoing a type of midlife crisis whose major life accomplishments happened years ago, but is still trying to tell everybody about it. So, you know, getting back to the subject of the war in Ukraine, you know, one year later and connecting with some of the points I raised earlier, uh, there are some growing concerns about, well, what to do next. And while sections of the political establishment are sounding more hawkish with calls to escalate the war, ranging from supplying jets to full-scale military intervention, uh, there's also some signs that anti-war sentiment is on the rise in many countries as well. As to once again reference my colleague uh, Vladimir Unkovsky koritzs article, uh, he notes a poll uh, conducted across nine EU states which showed that fewer than four in ten think that the war should continue until Ukraine wins back all of its territories. And almost one in three want peace as soon as possible, even at the expense of Ukraine losing territory. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, this latter view uh, is much more popular in uh, India, Turkey, and China. But these sentiments are unlikely to change the course of action among political leaders, uh, particularly in the West. Now, if any political leadership speaks out against continuing the war, or at the very least blindly and unconditionally funding it, uh, it tends to come either from the left or the national conservative right. And, you know, two ends of a political spectrum that are often demonized by a consistently hawkish liberal center uh, for either being unpatriotic or worse, just, you know, simply pro-Russian, which is enough to end any discussion within mainstream media. Still, the U.S. cannot fund Ukraine indefinitely, and with growing domestic problems ranging from the rising costs of food and fuel to a number of train derailments from crumbling infrastructure that neither Biden nor his allegedly well-qualified transportation secretary has officially addressed. By the way, East Palestine is in Ohio, a major swing state, so I don't know why we're ignoring that, but whatever. You know, next year's election season may see many question why Ukraine is more of a priority than one's own country and people. So whatever the next 10 to 12 months bring, the last year has shown us that we are in for a very uncertain and unstable future. And, uh, you know, I hope that what I've offered here uh, was informative and not too controversial. You know, right now I have no idea how the war in Ukraine will end, nor do I know what Ukraine will look like. And there's information about Ukraine gearing up for some major counteroffensive in hopes of dislodging Russia from its positions in the south, uh, so as to open up a way to retake Crimea. Now, in all honesty, this isn't impossible, but right now it seems rather improbable. Uh, Western media is no longer confidently stating that Ukraine will win, uh, but they remain guardedly optimistic that uh, the you know that all the support lent will produce some result, right? Some tangible gains that will give Zelensky some leverage uh, at any future negotiating table. Um, of course, if tensions continue to rise with China, 
we may see a shift in focus away from Ukraine and towards Taiwan, uh, in which case analytical videos like this will be much more frequent. I don't know if you take that as a promise or as a threat, but, uh, you know, that's basically all I can offer uh, right now. And, uh, you know, if you have any comments, questions, or points, uh, please leave them in the comment section below. If you've enjoyed the material and haven't done so already, uh, consider supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. Uh, I've said it already a number of times, but, um, you know, I really hope to make the definitive transfer away from institutionalized academia and towards more open-ended public scholarship, where videos like this can be more of a thing. Um, I have spent the last three to four days uh, working on this, and I've really, really enjoyed it. And this, of course, has come at the cost of me ignoring a pile of papers <laughs> that I uh, need to grade. So I need to get back to those before that pile just starts building up into the upcoming final exam. So thank you once again for listening, and uh, I hope to do this again real soon.